Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? No? Hi there. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Woo! Hello. We're going to start. Hello. Hello. So I'm very happy to welcome you all to this in-person visiting artist event. Really excited that it's in person. And um, in case we haven't met yet, my name is Amy Hauft, and I'm the director of the College of Art. Today, I have the happy job of introducing you to Maya Muchowski Parnas, the 2022 Wallace Herndon Smith Distinguished Visiting Artist for the Sam Fox School. Maya is also our Israel Institute Visiting Artist. Let me quickly tell you something about the Israel Institute's sponsorship of Maya. Among other things, the Institute promotes the contemporary culture of Israel by matching Israeli artists with American universities so they can come over for a semester and work with our students. We have been trying to get Maya here for two years with the pandemic keeping it from happening. Two ceramic courses for us this semester, introduction to hand building and another course on molds and multiples. She comes to us from Jerusalem, where she is a senior lecturer at the Bezalel Academy of Arts and Design, the premier art school in Israel. She earned her BFA there and her MA at the Royal College of Art in London. She's shown extensively in Israel, but also in London and across the US. She's done residencies at the Cité in Paris and at the Corning Museum of Glass in New York. She, She's a recipient of numerous prizes and her work is held in prestigious collections, including the Tel Aviv Museum of Art and the Israel Museum. Maya works primarily in clay and plaster using specialized casting techniques, co constantly hopscotching between the realms of art and craft. She's a consummate craftsman, a brilliantly skillful mold maker. She often borrows from domestic imagery to make objects that ask quiet and complicated questions about use and uselessness, about preciousness and bulk, about craftsmanship and storytelling, about craft and art. She employs a gorgeous palette and somehow makes plaster and clay act like neither thing, but even more so, if that makes any sense. Maybe it will after she talks to us about her work. So, Please take that as a little appetizer and help me welcome Maya Parnas. Um, wow, thank you so much, Amy. I, I don't have anything to add, you said it all. Um, so first of all, um, I would like to thank um, you, Amy for inviting me to teach here in Sam Fox, uh, for initiating this contact with the Israel Institute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, and I would like to thank the Israel Institute for sponsoring my visit. And I would also like to um, thank uh, Tim, Arnie, Andy, Dryden, uh, for really being so, uh, welcoming and so hospitable and so supportive. I tremendously um, appreciate it. And I uh, would also like to thank my TAs, Jamie and Paulina, and all my students and all of you for coming here uh, this evening. Um, yeah, so, well, actually, Amy, you've said, <laughs> you've said it all. Um, I figure out how to lower the light. I don't know how to do it exactly. No, um, does anybody know? It's, it says over there. But I don't know. Which Someone's going to come and help us. Room control, maybe? Thank you. <laughs> the mic's on. It's just that we want to lower the lights. Oh, lower the lights, yes. Ah, that's good. Go. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, oh, 
Okay, so um, I suggest uh, I start. Uh, um, so yeah, you said it. I'm, I'm from Jerusalem, I was born in Jerusalem, lived there most of my life. Um, and I'm, uh, I've been teaching for the last 16 years in Bezalel Academy of Art and Design in Jerusalem, which is the depart in the ceramics and glass department, which is the, the department in which I've studied. And I share my life uh, between the academy and my studio. This is my studio building. Um, just before COVID, I have moved into a new studio in the industrial zone of Givat Shaul in Jerusalem, and I share it with my husband, who is an industrial designer. Um, yeah, and I think I, su I suggest I start showing my work, and I think things will unfold uh, throughout. Um, just that you know, I've decided today to show you um, my works not in a chronological order, but to start with two with the two most recent projects, and then I'll go back and show you some highlights and some selected works uh, from the past. So the very last uh, work that I did just before coming to St. Louis is called, um, the work is called Fan with a Lady. Um, this is it. Um, and I can tell you that I do, um, um, well, uh, sculptural um, installations, mostly in ceramic materials. Th this work is uh, made out of porcelain. These are porcelain casts. And uh, another thing I think that is characteristic of my work is that I always work towards um, uh, towards exhibition. I mean, it, it's always contextual. I hardly ever work regardless. It, it, my work always has like an address, um, a destination. Um, so um, in this case, um, the context was an exhibition called A Stone's Throw Away in, in a gallery that is a photography gallery in, uh, in central uh, Jerusalem. A photography gallery that, which is part of a, a college named Hadassah Academic College right in the center of Jerusalem. And another thing I can say about this work um, is that actually uh, this figure or this sculpture is not really mine. I mean, it's a quote or a reference to a work of art by another artist. Here you can see the original in the middle. Um, it's a work called Lady with a Fan, and it is uh, carved out of wood. It is an, a work by an artist named Hanna Orloff, and it is part of the permanent collection of a small museum called the Tycho House, which is uh, also in the center of Jerusalem, round, right around the corner from the gallery. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is um, this is Hanna Orloff. This is the artist. She was born 1888, died 1968. Um, she was born in Ukraine. She immigrated to Palestine, and then she moved to Paris and actually lived most of her life. Um, in Paris. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, right. So um, this work has been, I mean, I remember this work already from childhood from this little uh, museum and I always, I was always kind of very, um, I mean, I found it, I, um, I was drawn to it. I mean, I, I I felt it has very beautiful um, details and, and a very like, elegant shape. I was always kind of uh, intrigued by the fact that the uh, wooden knot is situated exactly in the navel. I don't know how the artist did it exactly, um, but it, it's a work that I uh, really, really liked. Um, yeah, so um, for, first of all, I would like to tell you that if you want to make use of a, of a work that is uh, not your, yours, of course, you have, have to ask for permission. So I, um, I contacted the curator of the museum, and, uh, and also, and she has contacted the heirs 
of, uh, of the artist. It's the granddaughter of Han Orloff, who lives in uh, Paris. And um, luckily, they, they have agreed that I will make uh, use uh, of, uh, of the work. So I've teamed up with a, with a um, friend, a colleague who is a photographer. And he introduced me to this uh, technology called photogrammetry. So you see here, uh, the, the sculpture is being photographed. And, and just in a few words, it's a technology of, uh, of um, mapping and, uh, and measuring. And, um, and it actually enables to extract 3D information from still photography. So it means if you take a lot of photographs of an object, and it could be any object, it could also be a house or something uh, larger, um, you, can, um, you can actually build a digital model uh, out of it. And, uh, and this is uh, what we did. Um, so uh, this is a museum worker, and he placed the sculpture on a, a turning table, like the ones we have in the workshop. And he turned it around each time in a few degrees until it was, uh, um, until uh, the photographer photographed from all angles, also from bottom uh, to, to the top. Um, yeah. Okay, so I took the information and I have, um, yeah. Uh, you see there is a little hole in the in the top he didn't he forgot to take pictures from the top so we had to fill it up later um, and I took it and I've uh, 3d printed it in very small scale and I have uh, here you can see the process because it was exhibited in a college so I thought we, we well together with the creators we thought it would be right because it's an educational institution so to show like the whole process um, of the translation into um, porcelain. Um, and, um, and here you can see a close up of the finished work and you can also see my students already know that uh, closed hollowed ceramic objects need a vent. So you see I can put, I, I have put the vent in the navel just as a reference to the um, original. Um, and I think, um, well, maybe conceptually speaking about the work, it's a very simple work. I mean, the, the figure actually just, you know, she, she does this turning uh, movement. Um, but I think um, on top of the fact that it relates to the place, and also I find this also a kind of a statement, um, well, maybe I didn't mention, but the, um, this, the gallery and this little museum, they sit on a very, um, um, I would say, sensitive uh, axis, like an historical street in Jerusalem, which is like a seam line between various neighborhoods, um, ultra-Orthodox, religious, Jewish, um, secular, modern city center, um, there is, it, it, the street starts in uh, Damascus Gate, which you might have heard from the news. It's where all the stabbings occur. So it, you have everything. You have the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. You have the r religious tension. It's all there. And I think that the curators with this title, Stone's Throwaway, I have the feeling that they referred also to stone throwing maybe as um, something that is... Uh, um, associated with the Palestinian uprising. But I had the feeling they are, put, they are kind of thinking of this, but I thought, and I still think, that I think that the cultural um, um, heritage um, of art is also a part of the place. And I think the sculpture has lived there for many, many years, and it was important to me to show also this uh, aspect of the um, Jerusalem uh, reality. So this is one thing. And another thing, uh, this, um, this, uh, this motion is something that is, is also occupies me a lot and, and you will see it also in other works that I will show later. So this 
kind of attempt to convey time through motion, through change, um, and especially in, in related to ceramic objects and sculptures in general for me, a lot of times they feel very inanimate, especially in the way they are displayed in museums. Uh, by the way, here, um, this little museum, they, I just go back, they've renovated it recently, so I really don't like it. She's like stuck inside this shelving unit. You cannot see her back or anything. So I feel that I took her out like for a round at the neighborhood, and uh, I know it's, <laughs> yeah. And, and by the way, a lot of my work begin with a, like a silly thought. Uh, so yeah, so this was one work. Um, and the other, uh, another project that I participated in was last summer. Um, I just want to say a few words about COVID. Um, so I know a lot of my artist friends actually had a, a fantastic time during COVID. I think uh, artists are never bored and all they need is time and some materials. Um, and uh, so they had no problem with the social distancing and uh, with the lockdowns. But personally, uh, I had a quite a hard time. Also because what I told you earlier about me working towards projects and uh, suddenly many things were either um, canceled or postponed. Like Amy said, I was supposed to be here last year. This was postponed and I, I suddenly found myself like with an empty diary and I felt, you know, I, I, I didn't have anything to, wor to work towards. And, um, and then I came across this um, open call um, for an exhibition in uh, Poland, in Krakow, in, in Krakow's Jewish quarter. It's called Kazimierz. Kazimierz. Um, and um, they were looking for site-specific uh, public participatory um, work um, that, would that would be um, created over distance. I mean, it was supposed to be conceptualized, produced, and implemented from, f from afar. And I really uh, liked the idea. I mean, I really liked the idea that they took like the COVID um, restrictions and they turned it into like an like enabling uh, constraint. Um, and, um, and also, I'm, I'm very, um, well, my, uh, three of my four grandparents were uh, Polish, and well, the fourth, fourth one was also not far from Poland. And um, I don't have to tell you about Jewish uh, history, I think, in the middle of the previous century. Uh, but um, I think sometimes the, the past is like a heavy burden. I mean, m my grandparents were Holocaust survivors, and I felt very convenient in visiting Poland from far, like not having to kind of confront it. Um, again, I have nothing against the Polish people of today. It's, it's like a personal thing um, that, I, that I never visited it, and I don't know. Anyway, um, so I... Uh, I uh, um, applied to this exhibition. This is my great grandfather. And in the work that I uh, proposed and uh, eventually was accepted, I, I really wanted to deal with, not with the Holocaust, but with the rich and vivid and productive Jewish life that was there before the war. And I chose this one branch of the family. Um, and they were actually um, candle manufacturers uh, so I think I could relate more, most to this branch also as, as they were craftsmen and, uh, you know, the relation to a material, uh, this co the committed routine, I, I felt that uh, um, I can relate to it most. Um, and, uh, and I had this, again, I think it's, it's like a silly idea, but um, I thought it, that it would would be really nice if I can uh, temporarily revive this little, um, it's not even manufacturing, it was like a, like a workshop, if I understand. Well, again, my grandmother is not alive anymore. I don't have anyone to ask. I don't have many details about it. Um, but, I, but I thought it would be nice to revive it, like 
uh, a century later to reopen it for the 10 days. It was, I don't know if I mentioned, it was part of the Jewish Culture Festival, so I, it, which is 10 days, and I thought it would be nice uh, to have it. And um, because I hardly know anything about exactly the technique and what, what um, I don't have any information about the original workshop. I thought I will invent. I think as artists we have the privilege that we can invent. And, um, uh, and this is what I did. So first of all, I started uh, like experimenting in my studio with wax and with different kinds of wax. And I started dipping all sorts of things. This is a parsnip that was long time inside the wax. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I decided, I mean, I was not really interested in producing candles. It was more of a, a symbolic act of uh, reopening this workshop. And um, here you have already the workshop. And, and I asked the po Polish public to bring with them um, uh, objects that contain memories of different points in their lives. And only, the only condition is that they are agreed to uh, let go or to, to part from these objects. I mean, they bring them and they don't take them back. And then I designed, again, everything from far. I didn't send anything. Uh, so it was all instructions uh, that I sent. And these are volunteers um, that are working the festival. Um, so there were like a few stations in the workshop. Um, I put like index card, so each one who entered had to fill in what he brought, uh, tell me a little bit about the objects, then tie them into a, a cotton thread, and then um, dip it inside uh, this wax, hot wax melting pot. They can dip it as many times as they want. The more they dip it, then it becomes more vague, amorphic, uh, unrecognizable, and then it was hung in um, outdoor construction, and it was like kind of a growing installation outside. And it was a great experience. I mean, I was sitting in, on, in my sofa at home getting images through WhatsApp from my exhibition in Poland, and it was a very strange feeling. I was there and I was not there. This is already um, the outdoors. Yeah, and I think the wax has this very special quality that on the one hand, it's, it preserves the object. And on the other hand, it's also, it's a very fragile, um, like vulnerable material, very sensitive uh, to heat um, and and perishable. So, in term, if if we're speaking about like these memory capsules, so they're like they, they keep the memories, and on the other hand, they, as I said, they, it, it's also a way of of uh, parting from um, the memories. And and this uh, this final installation, I also see it like as a. Um, collective memory made out of many little capsules of a subjective ones. And the only thing I got back from this exhibition was the filled index cards. And I found it very touching. I mean, I, I keep them. And I, I show you here some. It was very hard for me just to choose a few. By the way, um, I saw they are looking for volunteers for next summer's festival. I think it's a great opportunity for students. I know they're covering all the living expenses and so on. So if anyone wants, uh, I'll be happy to give information about that later. Um, okay, so I'm going back to like an earlier uh, work now. 
So it's a work, I apologize, I, might have, I showed it to some of the students already. It's a work called 1985 to, to 2012. And the name of the work um, it indicates the lifespan of this uh, radio cassette player um, that was a birthday gift for my 12th birthday. And uh, I have this thing, I, I kind of get attached to objects. Um, so uh, actually it was working until 2012. <laughs> And, but I couldn't really throw it away, so I did. It, I did like a death mask, so I uh, I, I cast it in uh, in slip cast, um, and then I kind of tried to convey, you know, its lifespan or its uh, its disappearance, and I did it in an interesting technique. I've um, I've made a, a mold and I cast, and then when you um, fire ceramics, ceramics always shrinks a little bit. So I fired. When it came out of the kiln, I made a new mold, another cast, again shrunk. So like each object here had a separate mold. So for this kind of minimalist work, it was quite a lot of work behind it. It took me months to do it. And uh, also, um, I would say that when it's, it's like a copy of a copy of a copy. So it's like when you do a Xerox over Xerox, like the information, you, you slowly lose the information, so it became, becomes more vague and more the shape, it loses the shape a little bit, becomes a little distorted. Um, and of course, the, the fading of the color is like, is my manipulation. I mean, uh, I, I had complete control over the color. Here you see the very last one. Um, it's hard to see the details because it's white with white background, but it looks almost like textile. There is something, uh, the shape became, became like wobbly. I don't know how to say that. This is the original. Uh, so this work is now, at the, it belongs to the Israel Museum collection and I donated all, also the original radio tape to the design department. <laughs> I think it's already a design uh, icon. Um, now I go to another work, which it's called On a Clear Day, and it, it's the first work that relates to landscape. After that, I had like a series of works relating to landscapes, and actually it's something that I'm still very much interest, interested in. And it was an exhibition called Comfortscapes, and, um, and I chose to relate to uh, the landscape that I have from my house, um, which is, it's the look from Jerusalem towards the east. So you would see there is like the uh, Judea desert. And after that, there is like a mon mountainous strip of land. It's actually, it's, it belongs to Jordan already. It's called the Moab Mountains. Um, and it's very beautiful and it's, it's, it changes uh, according to the time of day, the season, the weather and so on. And so I kind of try to convey also the landscape as something that is not stable. Um, and, what, and this is actually unfired clay. So for whoever comes here from clay background or so my students already know how um, recycled clay, when you put clay in water, it goes back to being like soil. And always when I look at the recycling bucket, it looks like a little landscape. So I've, in, instead of recycling in a bucket, I built this, these long uh, con rectangular containers and I recycled it like in an elongated way and dried it out. And so these are, it's a very slim work, very long. Um, here, here is the whole work. It's very long and, and very slim. And um, what else can I say about it? Uh, um, and, and the background is a dismantled color fan of this, you know, um, wall painting uh, company. And another work that relates actually to that same landscape is, uh, is this work. Um, and this is a work uh, that kind of was... Um, I don't know what to say. It was born by mistake. <laughs> I was actually, it was at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. It was like my first big solo exhibition. And I was actually working on something else 
I was working, well, here's the landscape, just so you see the colors. Um, so I was work, working on a huge <laughs> installation work and I had an accident in my studio and this whole wall uh, collapsed on me. And uh, yeah, I was like buried beneath this. It was four tons of clay. And luckily I, I had um, assistants working with me that day. Yeah, that's after <laughs> the accident. And they kind of dug me out. Uh, <laughs> if I would be alone, I wouldn't be here today. Um, so yeah, they dug me out and I, I knew that this work is gone and there's no way I'm going to uh, redo it. And I had to rethink and I was in time pressure and I said, okay, if this landscape, if there's something comforting about it, I'm going back to my landscape. And these are just this, um, um, oops. Um, the lumps of clay, oh, the packs, sorry, these are packs, they're all the same volume, um, the 12 kilos, I don't remember, in pounds, Dryden, how much are they? The pound, 20 pounds. Um, uh, so, yeah, so they're just like that and, and I've um, hollowed them out. Uh, so they look like fresh and unworked, but they're all, you know, I've cut them open, hollowed, closed it, tried to um, disguise where I, I didn't, uh, not to show the scar. And if you look closely, can you see the mark? No. So anywhere on the left, you can see like shoe prints. I mean, there are some um, remains of the tragedy behind it. <laughs> Um, but it's just actually packs of clay and it, they're fired and then they are dipped in, uh, in lime wash. Um, yeah. Okay. Another, um, another work um, that uh, relates to the landscape. It, um, there were these two American curators who have seen the previous work. And they told me that they're organizing an exhibition in the U.S., a traveling exhibition and um, they asked me if I can do, they, want, they liked the previous work, but they did not have any wall space to put it. So if I can do like another installation, like a floor piece. And I was thinking, you know, um, I have this landscape, but actually if you look down, there is this dead, the Dead Sea. Um, the Dead Sea for whoever doesn't know, it's, a, it's actually not a sea, it's a salt lake. And it's um, also, if I'm sp speaking about landscape as something that is changing and sometimes also transient, I think the, the Dead Sea is drying out. I mean, um, it's, uh, it, its level is uh, sinking uh, very rapidly and uh, um, it's going to disappear in a few decades. And, uh, and I thought, you know, it, um, um, I, I thought I would like to, to do a work um, in relation to that. Technically speaking, these are like these, these are like puddles of slip cast, like pancakes of slip cast uh, with, with pigment. So very simple. I made, I made large amount and I've, uh, um, I've packed them nicely and I've sent and I knew, that I'm not going to be there, so um, the person to um, install my work, it would be either um, gallery assistants or students because it was exhibited in some university galleries in the US. So I sent an, a picture of a physical map of the Dead Sea from the 1950s on the left. This is like from Google, it's more, more recent. And I sent like general instructions um, of, uh, of installing it, but I wanted to leave some place for the installer to kind of have a freedom of choosing exactly what kind of a Dead Sea um, they would like to um, um, compose. Uh, this, I think it's in Miami University. Um, this is in Towson, Mar Maryland University. So actually, you see that, like that, the, these pastel colors is something that 
it uh, appears a lot in my work. I'm kind of drawn to this color palette. Um, and um, the truth is, I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't really aware of it for many years. I had a friend who studied with me at the RCA, came to visit me once, and we went to the Dead Sea, and she said, oh, Maya, now I see where your color, color palette comes from. And I was like, really? I was, <laughs> I was not aware of it. Uh, but, but yeah, there is something, especially in the Dead Sea, the, the air, it's very like hazy, the colors, and again, very kind of uh, um, pastel-like. Okay, this is a work was was also at the exhibition at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. I, was, I just turned 40 and I did myself a birthday present. I made myself 40 hula hoops. Um, and this actually relates to a memory um, of um, um, like a, a birthday ritual in kindergartens in Israel with the kindergarten teacher, she would put like the number of uh, hula hoops as the age of the child and you had to like hop from one to another. So I, th I thought, you know, it um, would be interesting to do a, a 40, uh, a version for a 40th birthday. Um, but uh, the idea behind it is also to give like a physical um, presence to something that is very hard, you know, like uh, time, uh, um, like, like a more abstract uh, concept and, and to try to give it like a physicality. Yeah, and it is cast, so, and it is, it's a one-to-one -one scale. So very fragile. Okay, now we move on to a landscape which is not Israeli. <laughs> So, um, um, what you see here is actually um, a series of, um, it's, it's a plaster work. The, the, these are casts of uh, a, um, like a bleach detergent, and it's a dismantled um, um, calendar of uh, St. Moritz, and St. Moritz, for whoever does know, it's, a, it's like a fancy, um, a fancy vacation resort in the Swiss Alps. And I just say that some th sometimes things happen um, um, by chance. So here I was invited to um, exhibit in, um, in an exhibition in a supermarket in an active supermarket in one of the industrial zones of Jerusalem, um, just across from my previous uh, studio. And the curator told me, go have a walk at the supermarket and see, choose a place in which you would like to install your work. Um, or, um, and, I, and I went there and I was um, immediately drawn to the Isle of the Detergents. And um, also at the same time, I received the belongings of my grandparents. I know they I mentioned them a lot today. Um, so I, my grandfather was an extremely tidy and organized person and I got like a whole pile of calendars. And I think a calendar really as an object, he kept all their calendars. <laughs> I think it, uh, as an object, it's, it's also, you know, an object that conveys like a, a time span. So I had this calendar in my mind and I had these detergents uh, and you know, a lot of times the in, in detergent industry, they use the imagery of these beautiful, pure landscapes to sell the detergents and I found it a little ironic. Um, and I also felt, you know, I'm, it's, it's really, it's, an, it's a, the supermarket. Ah, sorry, I have, I have, uh, this is, in this, it's, I don't have good photos because the lighting was really bad and I had to put also this plastic sheet so that people do not touch it. Um, but it was like only a few days because, you know, this shelving uh, space, especially in eye level, is extremely valuable. So they would let us exhibit there only for a few days. And then it was shown again in a gallery, but just a fragment. They didn't have a place for the whole 12 months. Um, but, uh, but I kind of had the feeling that this was like a very, the supermarket is like in a very 
I don't know, want to say miserable, but it's a very uninteresting plain place, an area of like car repairs and everything. And it's like, it's the farthest place from this fancy um, um, and also kind of sublime uh, uh, landscape. And I um, thought it would be like interesting to join these two different things together. Technically speaking, I cast it, I just cast directly into the plastic containers. I collected them from recycling bins. And I, the good, interesting thing about plastic um, containers is they're so thin that their interior and exterior are more or less the same. So you can just cast and then tear off the plastic and you have it. And I've worked as if it was marble. I mean, with a, a um, chisel and a hammer, I just kind of broke it until I was satisfied with the... Um, um, with the result. Um, okay, and last one. Um, next work. Right, so this is something interesting that I found out. It's not a work, yeah, but it's something interesting that I found out now while my visit here in St. Louis. So this is actually not Jerusalem. This is here in Forest Park. I just realized that in the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, there was a one-to-one -one scale model of Jerusalem. It's the biggest ever model of Jerusalem that was built. And um, it was like one of the main attractions of the exhibition. And I can say that it, by the photograph, it really resembles, it, except the Ferris wheel uh, behind, <laughs> and also in real Jerusalem, there's no sign <laughs> saying Jerusalem. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know. I I think this will somehow find its way into a work. I I still it's still. Um, I, I don't know exactly how, and also uh, by the way, I read. I'm now reading about it, so I read that they have imported. Uh, locals. <laughs> I don't know exactly what this means, but to, I don't know, to work there and send, sell souvenirs and there were like uh, donkey and camel riding or things like that. So I just thought it's funny that I'm also like an imported local <laughs> in, in St. Louis. Um, this is it. Thank you very much for coming. No questions. Oh, yes. Um, explain why you have to have a vessel and a hollow ceramic. Uh, is that when it's in fire? Is that what? Is that when it's in fire? Yes, yes, because the air has to have like a way out. As, because the material shrinks, so if you lock, if you create a balloon with locked air inside, it will either crack or, or explode. Yeah. You have to come to my course for that, <laughs> Jack. <laughs> yes, uh, Ray. Bird, you mentioned how during, especially the pandemic, you ran into a lot of issues finding you know, words to tackle. Mm -hmm. I can even imagine the studio space approach kind of a roadblock. Uh, what do you like to do whenever that happens to you? Yeah, well, luckily it hasn't happened uh, before. Um, I, I think I was somehow lucky that I always, things uh, somehow always kept rolling. I don't know how to call it exactly. Um, but uh, look, I'm going to the studio anyhow. I mean, and, and I do do some work. I just don't call it like a finished work. So I'm playing or experimenting, but it's hard for me. I would not do like a big installation just like that. Um, I go, I think, out of habit to the studio anyway, anyhow. And I also go there to do sometimes computer work or things like that. But, um, uh, yeah, but I, I really think also for you students that to apply for open calls, I think, first of all, there are extremely interesting things out there. I really uh, recommend to do that. And it's a very good way 
to kind of, for, especially for young artists, to, to start a career, to start building a curriculum. Um, so I, I really recommend that. And it's also a good sport. I mean, I know it's sometimes not pleasant to get like negative response, and it happens, but I think it's also good to get used to <laughs> getting negative response. In a, yes? Um, that's a hard question. Um, I think so, yeah. Well, I, I just cho chose a few works, but I do have earlier works that have the same format and are not landscape. So it, it of course, has this kind of... I like the fact that it has the view from close, so we can look at them individually, and then you have from far away. And also that... Um, some of them were exhibited like in corridors, so you kind of walk and have the work like following you. So it, it's like a means to, again, to maybe spend some more time, um, I don't know, along the work, or it's hard for me to explain. Um, I don't know, does this answer your question? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Which is like a landscape experience right. as a viewer. Mm -hmm. um, did, did even your, um, your um, cassette player? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Joseph. So, so what are you planning on doing with like, <laughs> research? I don't know yet. <laughs> and also, if I have some thoughts, I will not share it. It's still, it's not cooked yet. It's, no, it's too early. I don't know. And I'm not sure it will happen. I don't think it will happen here. I see my time is running out in St. Louis. So I don't know exactly. Um, um, but I, I have the feeling that it will find its way to my work. Yes? You? Hmm, it's a good question. Um, I don't know. Um, physically, you mean? I mean, I would like, I, I, I would hope that the work would be thought provoking. Um, I always also want them to have, like, um, as I said before, they would be interesting from far and from near as well in a different way. Um, some, I think some of my works are also kind of, they have to be uh, discovered. I mean, some of them are really, for instance, this first, landscape work that I showed, the one with the unfired clay, it was, it was very, very narrow. And a lot of times, especially like in group exhibitions, there are works that are much more present and, and dominant. And um, so, um, yeah, I think as artists, eventually what we want is, is a certain uh, attention from the public. But then it's also open. I mean, it's not that I, I mean, things are, um, I mean, I'm happy for people to experience it however they like. Yes? And what, and what was the second part of the question? Ah, okay. Um, 
Okay, so I started, um, I started very early. I mean, I started, it's, our program is different than here. I mean, we choose, I, um, we don't have like a foundation and so on. I chose to study ceramics. So I, I started my undergraduate first year ceramics. And I kind of, the first choice, I mean, um, the initial um, decision was, um, was very kind of intuitive. I, I didn't know exactly what I want to study. And I said, I'll start with something that I know that I like to do, and then we'll see. And I, first of all, I, I found out that I'm very, um, that I can express myself in this material. Um, and I think, you know, a material is eventually, it's, it's a language. And, and, uh, and I felt comfortable in communicating in this language. And I also like the fact that it's very, very diverse. There are so many, um, clay is actually an, it's an amorphic uh, material. So there's so many things you can, uh, various like languages to it. Um, that I, I feel that it's a, it's a very rich world and I never like have enough of it. So I do, as you see, sometimes I have my plaster works. Also, I'd, I've done some works in paper. So it's not like a strict thing, but I find myself always going back to this. Any more questions? Yes? Thank you. Life lifespan of the works. Um, yeah, it's a good question. So first of all, actually, galleries is usually temporary. Um, so exhibitions do eventually, either the work is sold or it comes back to my studio, so it's also a temporary thing. Um, I can say that some of my works, um, for instance, the work of unfired clay, I mean, I, I didn't keep it, it's gone. I mean, it's, a, it, it, it's a, I don't know, it's a perishable uh, work of art can also say about the plaster that it, it doesn't age well. It's very hard to keep plaster in good condition. Um, and yeah, um, I, I don't know, did I answer your question? Thank you.